October 22 is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Adventist History Podcast, episode number 51, Conchies. Last time, we took a break. Yep. Well, okay then. Welcome to season two of the Adventist History Podcast. We had a great season one, starting with the story of William Miller and ending by killing off our main character, Ellen White. Bam! Never saw it coming. What a season finale. Why are we breaking the show up in the seasons anyway? Well, I explained this in the last episode, but I will save you a few minutes and explain it again. There are two particular reasons. Let me start with the second reason, which is that at some point we're going to run out of history. I don't know when, but we will. We'll arrive at the general conference session of 2020 or something, and we'll have to stop while the history elves go make some more history for us. Then we can launch another season, a season three and four, and start a new story about Adventist history. Guys, we could tell this whole story from the perspective of women or from South Americans or dogs or whatever. We could even talk about the history of Adventists and food. We could interview interesting people. We could even talk about the history of Adventist history. I just blew your mind. Admit it. Clean it up. Point is, there's a lot of stories to tell, and seasons are easy ways to break those stories up. Now, seasons one and two are defined by Ellen White. Season one is defined by her presence. Season two is defined by her absence. And I want you to pay attention to that absence as we go through season two, especially with these first few episodes. Ellen White performed a role in the Adventist church no one has been able to perform. And we'll talk about that more as we go on. So let's begin season two by talking about the first World War. It's really a strange thing to talk about the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the First World War. It's strange because Adventists in the First World War have two opposite experiences. One of those experiences was great. We've talked about General Conference President A.G. Daniels' tour of the Pacific, crowds awaiting him at those stops, we talked about the Eastern question and how Adventist interest in prophecy hadn't been this high since 1844. It just seemed like a massive end-time prophecy was just about to be fulfilled right in front of their eyes. The signs were all there. So close. It was an exciting time. One Adventist wrote in 1914, the heart of every Seventh-day Adventist must be thrilled by the present situation in Europe, end quote. Okay, maybe try not to sound so excited about the worst war in world history, but they weren't exactly excited about the war. They were excited about the fulfillment of prophecy. Not since 1844 had there been such a sense of purpose and energy in the church. And church leaders were also excited about Churches filling up with new members and money pouring in. The Northern New England Conference, which had been suffering in late decades, grew by 25% during the war. Leaders in Australia were astonished at how much the church was growing during the war years. In 1915, the Review's special war extra issue flew off of the presses. It sold one million copies in 20 days. Adventists had never sold so many papers so fast. One general conference officer proclaimed that, quote, God has marvelously blessed the work. War, pestilence, famine, earthquake, and fire have stimulated rather than retarded the message in its steady advance, end quote. The officer went on in breathless excitement about all the missionaries the church was sending out and the opportunity which the World War provided. Meanwhile, the other experience that Adventists had during the First World War was hardship and misery. Now, Adventists were registered as a peace church in America since the Civil War, and that meant almost nothing to the rest of the world. James Cutmore was not an Adventist, but he did have three daughters, 
He was a patriot, and he attempted to volunteer for the British Army in 1914, but he was sent home because he had poor eyesight. Two years later, in 1916, he was walking home from work when a stranger, a woman, approached him and handed him a white feather. James Cutmore enlisted the next day. Two years later, he was dead on the battlefield. His nine-year-old daughter remembered it vividly 70 years later. She still hated the woman who had given her father that feather. Now, that white feather was powerful in England. It was a symbol of cowardice and shame. If, if one of these women saw a young man of fighting age dressed in street clothes, she would approach him and give him a white feather because the only thing more terrifying than German guns was having your masculinity publicly destroyed by a woman. That's why Cutmore and countless other men joined. The whole feather thing was completely abused, as you can imagine. After all, Cutmore wasn't a coward. He had tried to join the army two years before. And veterans who would return home to recoup from their injury, for instance, also found themselves the recipients of the dreaded white feather, which infuriated them. It was this shotgun approach to shame, but it more often worked than it didn't. Those who refused to fight were taunted, shamed, dehumanized, and while some men could shrug all of that off, many more couldn't take it. So as sisters lost brothers, as mothers lost sons, daughters lost fathers, and wives lost husbands in France, resentment grew toward conscientious objectors. When Britain began conscripting men of military age, 130 Adventists found their names on the list. Britain, of course, recognized conscientious objectors, but you really are never sure whether someone honestly takes a moral stand against combat or whether they're just a coward and they don't want to fight and they're pretending to have a conscience. So many conscientious objectors were arrested. The idea here was to treat conscientious objectors so poorly that if any of them were cowards, they would rather go fight than deal with their own people back home. In other words, the British guards who watched over these conscientious objectors became the enemy. Now, conscientious objectors were called conchies in England, which is what I'm going to roll with in this podcast because it is like 75% fewer syllables. So if you wanted to be a conchi, you had to appear before a tribunal. The members of the tribunal were usually local elites, like Neville Chamberlain, the future prime minister. There were different types of conchis, by the way, some who were happy to make bombs or to serve as medics. They were interested in alternative ways of serving, something other than carrying a gun. But you also had absolutists, and they refused to have anything to do with the war whatsoever. They didn't want to work in a bomb factory. They didn't want to be a medic healing soldiers so they could go back and fight. They wanted nothing to do with the war whatsoever. Speaking of Neville Chamberlain, he actually heard a case from a Quaker accountant and just couldn't understand why this man wouldn't serve as an accountant in a munitions factory. In his mind, I'm sure that seems so much better than being on the front. I mean, right? How many guys on the front lines would rather be an accountant in a munitions factory rather than be out there? But this Quaker refused, and so he was arrested. Because if you applied as a conscientious objector and were rejected by the tribunal, then you were considered to be absent without leave from your military unit. So applying to be a conchi was not a decision you made lightly. One Adventist had to appear before 13 tribunals during the war. And as losses mounted over in France, the tribunals looked for any reason whatsoever to send somebody to the front. The Imperial War Museum noted that, quote, to become a conscientious objector in 1916 was a difficult decision, which apparently involved rejecting the whole of conventional British society and everything it stood for. 
The conscientious objector was trapped psychologically. He felt guilt if he shared the soldier's ordeal and guilty if he did not. End quote. Cartoons in the paper depicted conscientious objectors as sitting at home in their favorite chair surrounded by their family, smoking and relaxing. The caption read, This little pig stayed at home. After the war ended, many conchies were only released from prison six months later so that the soldiers who were returning home would be able to find jobs before those cowards who refused to fight. Conchies also lost the right to vote, until 1926. Of the 130 Adventists conscripted in the UK, 17 absolute conscientious objectors would go to Dartmoor Prison. Now, Dartmoor was a massive prison complex designed for POWs in the Napoleonic Wars because keeping those prisoners aboard ship just docked just uh, out of the harbor was considered inhumane. So they decided to build this massive prison complex complex just for them. Happy birthday. In 1917, the inmates who had been housed in Dartmoor were told that if they would join the army, their sentence would be annulled or forgiven or however you want to put it. That way, there was room in the prison for conscientious objectors to be housed. Officials made it clear that the conchies weren't actually prisoners. Their cells were left open, but they were not exactly free. Many did hard labor, breaking granite boulders with sledgehammers. It was one of the harshest penalties in the English penal system. Still, life could be worse. About 1,000 conscientious objectors ended up in Dartmoor over the course of the war, some with pretty cushy jobs and some who died under poor medical care. Years later, an Adventist by the name of A.E. Milner admitted that he was a sergeant guarding conchies at Dartmoor during the First World War. There he met one of the 17 Adventists there, N.H. Knight. Apparently Knight led this young guard to become an Adventist. When Milner related the story, many decades later, he was president of the Ontario-Quebec Conference in Canada. Those in Dartmoor had it easier than those Adventists who were shipped to France. Fourteen Adventist students were taken from what is now Newbold College in 1916 and sent to a combat unit in France. They were handed uniforms and rifles, which they refused to take. So they were sentenced to 14 days of field punishment, which meant something like hard labor during the day and what they called crucifixion at night. In this case, crucifixion meant being tied back to back with your arms up in the air, usually strapped to a gun carriage or something like that. After the sentence was pronounced, they were marched to the detention barracks. But the commandant there decided that if they would make up the work during the week, they could have Sabbath off. Hey, and that worked out great for like 18 months. But in 1917, a new commander moved the Adventists to military prison number three which is a really ominous name. It doesn't even have some nice geographical reference to it. It's just military prison number three. They might as well just rename it. We don't care about you, number four. Anyways, they were told that they had to work on Sabbath. W.W. Armstrong was one of those 14 and remembers being beaten for refusing to work on Sabbath. The next day, the guards told the Adventists in each cell next to Armstrong to get to work. Then there was quietness. Armstrong's cell opened. The sergeant smiled and said that Armstrong's fellow Adventists had already gone out to work. Don't be a fool, Armstrong. Just go with the flow here. Your friends have all gone out to work. Join them. Armstrong was stunned. I mean, had his friends, his Adventist friends really betrayed him and gone out to work on Sabbath? Well, regardless, Armstrong told the sergeant, all the other Adventists can go work on Sabbath, but I will not. The sergeant's smile faded, and Armstrong was beaten again. And by the way, he later found out that none of the Adventists had actually gone out to work and that the sergeant was just lying to him to try to get him to crack. Well, after the sergeant left, he heard someone whistle a hymn. Soon all the Adventists in this cell block were singing with one another. The sergeant came rushing in because it was against the rules, 
to talk to one another, let alone sing. The sergeant was yelling at them to stop, but they kept singing all the verses. And yet, by the end of the song, the sergeant was quiet. He would go on to keep beating them, okay? It's not that kind of ending to the story. But that night, he left them alone. For some reason, that hymn affected him. One time, a corporal pulled his gun and pressed it against the head of one of the Adventists who refused to work on Sabbath. The corporal dared the Adventist to say no just one more time, because if he did, he was going to shoot him in the head and then claim that it was self-defense. The corporal said, and I quote, dead men tell no tales. In other words, you won't be able to say anything otherwise. It's my word against yours. On another occasion, an Adventist had 70 pounds of cement blocks tied around his neck with his hands handcuffed behind him, and then he was told to march. He eventually blacked out and collapsed. When word of life in military prison number three leaked back to England, the Adventist church filed a protest. The 14 were eventually released back home, but two of them would die prematurely because of their time there. So that's Britain. Adventists in Russia were told that a refusal to fight meant hard labor, prison sentences of between 2 and 16 years. One officer drew his sword and held it over an Adventist who refused to pick up his gun. That Adventist was sentenced to 18 years in Siberia, but was released after the communists took over in 1917. In Romania, three Adventists were sentenced to be shot. An officer took the first Adventist into the woods and had him dig his own grave. He stood the Adventist up right next to the grave and told him, I want you to think long and hard about this decision. If you really want to be a conscientious objector, I'm going to shoot you. So please think of your family, think of your friends, think of your loved ones. Is this really what you want to do? The first Adventist stood firm. The officer said, okay, lifted his gun and shot it in the air. He then scattered some animal blood on the grave and told that Adventist to get out of here and run through the woods. He then went and brought the second Adventist and told him that he had just killed the first Adventist, and I'm ready to kill you right now, so I'm going to give you a minute to think about your friends, think about your family, think about your life. Is this really what you want to do? The second Adventist said, well, if death wasn't too good for my friend, then it was not too good for me. So the officer again raised his gun, shot it up in the air, and told him to run off through the woods. Finally, the third Adventist was brought in, and when given time to think, he wavered, changed his mind, and said that he would fight. So the officer raised his gun in the air and shot that Adventist. If he wasn't faithful to God, the state didn't trust him to be faithful either. At least that was the nice moral lesson which other Adventists discerned from that story. American Adventists were slow to see the writing on the wall. Of course, Americans in general just lived in their own little bubble back then. Ah, the good old days. It was Europe's war, after all, wasn't it? But in 1916, the North American Division decided to look into training Adventists to be medics. We've been sharing some of the worst stories about Adventists in the war, but of course many did serve as non-combatants, like medics, just fine. What made this possible, especially in America, was a subtle change in the Adventist interpretation of the Sabbath. Turns out, it's kind of hard to run a hospital if you insist that everybody on staff doesn't work on Sabbath. So, an exception was made. Ellen White wrote, quote, There will always be duties which have to be performed on the Sabbath for the relief of suffering humanity, end quote. Okay, so an exception was made, and then another, and another, and another, and another, so that by the time we get to 1918, F.M. Wilcox said that the Sabbath was to be free of what he called unnecessary work. Well, then what is necessary work, you ask? Well, our good friend Wilcox has an answer for that. He gives some examples. He says, well, you, you have to water the horses on Sabbath. You have to milk the cows on Sabbath. You have to feed your kids on Sabbath. Some Adventists employed as domestic servants will have to work on Sabbath too. Adventist institutions still need security guards on Sabbath. And, of course, sanitarium staff need to care for the sick. Well, that's a fairly broad set of examples. And Wilcox knew it. He warned against making the exception into the rule itself. Wilcox believed that you could work on Sabbath in these ways and keep Sabbath. 
But these exemptions had a secularizing influence. An Adventist sanitarium could still have an air of sacredness on Sabbath. But what about, thinking decades down the road here, what about when Adventist doctors began to work at non-Adventist hospitals? That's another topic. But in any case, becoming an army medic clearly allowed an Adventist to serve in the military without violating their conscience. They didn't have to kill anyone, and they could work on Sabbath by saving lives. This enabled Adventists in America to become not just conscientious objectors, but the label that many of them preferred, conscientious cooperators. When the government wanted to raise money for the war, they raised taxes and they sold liberty bonds. The General Conference then recommended to its American members that they buy liberty bonds, even as they went to Loma Linda in Washington, eventually, to learn how to be medics so they didn't have to kill. Church leaders, going all the way back to James White, didn't seem to think that there was any kind of moral conflict between financially paying others to kill on your behalf, even while you refuse to bear arms. Anyway, in 1917, a statement was issued and carried in a secular paper, one in Minneapolis. A headline read, Will not fight, but will brave dangers to work for American government. Five points were outlined, the last of which read, quote, Always remember that a good Seventh-day Adventist is a good citizen, end quote. Adventists were encouraged to pray for the president, and a special offering was taken up for the Red Cross. Despite this loyalty to the government, Adventists in America suffered the same kinds of low-grade harassment that others did. Some were told that they would be recognized as conscientious objectors and then sent to fight anyway. Theodore Roosevelt declared that he wouldn't shoot conscientious objectors, but he would take them to a place where they would be shot at. And it didn't help that some Adventists in America were German immigrants who were very vocal about their support of the fatherland. So while Adventists had it better in America during World War I, it was never great. Speaking of Germany, by the way, we should talk about that. Because early on, church leaders there informed the government there that Adventists were good Germans and would fight in the army. 2,000 Adventists were called into the German army as a result, with 250 of them losing their lives. Conradi, leader of the European division in Germany, faced a tough choice. Germany was not England, nor was it America, and some conscientious objectors had already been shot. Conradi didn't want to see his life's work of building up the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Europe go to waste and have the deaths of hundreds of Adventists on his hands. So, yeah, the Kingdom of Bavaria agreed to recognize the Adventist Church so long as Adventists went to school on Sabbath and agreed to fight in case war broke out. Conradi took steps to ensure that Adventists would remain in favor with the state. He wrote to Daniels that Adventists are not opposed to military service on Sabbath, only service during peacetime. Only military service during peacetime. Conradi then appealed to Ellen White, interpreting her example as a European missionary back in the 1880s, to mean, and I quote, we would have to work out over here as best we could, end quote. Which is a very generous interpretation on the Ella White's views on this subject, to say the least. At every turn, Conradi defended his course as necessary to ensure Adventism's future in Germany. The Kaiser on one occasion had given Conradi 50,000 marks, which is a lot of money, to support the church's missionaries in Africa. Conradi firmly believed that Adventists should not work on Sabbath, okay? But he thought that the best way to achieve this was to make friends with the government, to not be the enemy of the state, but to be the friend and supporter of the state. Now, not all Adventists in Germany agreed with Conradi's position, as we'll see in a minute, but many, many did. One church noted that in Joshua 6, the Israelites performed their military service on Sabbath, so why can't we? 
Other German Avenists pointed to Romans 13 and argued that we owed obedience to the state. One Avenist writer invoked Martin Luther's belief that war in and itself is not evil. Conradi himself declared that, quote, the attitude of our brethren in the United States could not be decisive for us in Europe, end quote. In other words, it's a different situation here. We have to figure this one out on our own. Other German Adventists argued that to take a stubborn stand against combat meant becoming rigid Pharisees. And didn't the Jews in the book of Maccabees defend themselves on Sabbath? Others said that any killing in war is really the fault of the leaders, not the soldiers. Anyways, I, I think you get the idea. There were dozens and dozens of different angles and, and different approaches to justifying this path in Germany. The General Conference found it hard to communicate with Conradi during the war. We've talked about that a little bit before. But I think it's fair to say that the General Conference leaders probably did not agree with Conradi. But they were willing to extend him and his division the benefit of a doubt while his country was in chaos. And that leads us to the reform movement in Germany. As I said, not every Avenist in Germany agreed with Conradi. There were those who wanted to stand united against combat duty, as Adventists did in other countries, and they felt betrayed by Conradi. These dissenters began circulating pamphlets declaring that Conradi's alliance, I guess if you want to call it that, his alliance with the state was wrong. Both sides began blasting each other and accusing each other and, and stretching each other's words. The church responded by disfellowshipping and denouncing members of this reform movement, as they came to call themselves. And some church leaders even handed these reformers over to the police. It was ugly. Everyone believed that they were doing what was right, what was best for the church. And Conradi at least could point to the numbers. Oh, how Adventists love the numbers. Give me the numbers, all the numbers. The Adventist church during the war in, in Germany grew by 40%. In fact, we have evidence that around 300 members even joined because they were converted by Adventist soldiers during the war. In other words, those who signed up for duty, whether they were combatants or non-combatants, they looked at that as a missionary enterprise to try to convert other soldiers they, they were serving with. And it seems that that was somewhat successful. Now, we'll have occasion to talk more about the Seventh-day Adventist reform movement as we go on. But you should know that in 2014, which is, I know, 100 years after the First World War began, Adventist leaders in Germany officially apologized to members of the reform movement, which now numbers about 40,000 members around the world. It was the first major split after Ellen White's death. It was a split Ellen White might have prevented. When the dust cleared after the First World War, Adventists found that the world that was changing had changed. While the rhetoric of warmongering was wrapped in religious language. After all, every side was fighting for God. The effect of the war was a loss of cultural power for Christians. They just didn't fully realize it yet. Adventists in the West had hoped that the liberal slide towards secularism might be arrested by this catastrophic war. Maybe people would wake up and return to the values of their parents. They didn't. The sun that rose over the post-war horizon brought the dawn of a new secular age. And with the dawn came something the Seventh-day Adventist Church hadn't wrestled with since 1844. Doubt. Doubt. 